Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the second edition of the webinar Refugee Finance in Times of Uncertainty, Identifying Opportunities and Mitigating Risks. We have held one webinar already, and this is the second one. And we also would like to thank this time again our sponsors, Triple Jump and Microfinance Center for sponsoring this event and making this possible. But also I'd like to thank everyone here involved in the preparation and all of you in the audience to discuss with us this important topic today. Let me go on with introducing our speakers. Actually, we have eight people today with us uh, contributing. And uh, I go ahead with introducing to you the panelists first by the order of their speaking. So I start with Dumitru Vikul, who is a financial market and strategy expert focused on emerging economies. Welcome to the session to all of you. And uh, our second speaker is Dimitro Romanov, who is a banking expert and business analyst at Business and Finance Consulting. We have then again in the session, Malhas Zadua, who is a financial inclusion and strategy expert and the former CEO of a leading MFI in Georgia, Crystal where he was the CEO between 2004 and 2019. And last but not least, we have Miss Violette Coubier in our panel. She is from the foundation Grameen Credit Agricole in France and the program manager for technical assistance. Thank you very much to all of you for making the time today to contribute and to prepare. But uh, we also have special guests, which will contribute to this session today. And I'm happy to introduce Mr. Michael Newson, who is a senior labor mobility and social inclusion specialist at the IOM, uh, International Office for Migration. And we have uh, Mr. David Russia, analytical director at the Banking Association of Georgia. We have also Ms. Laura David, Head of Business Development at BGR Social Finance in Romania. And we have Nixon Kvarigyuka Kaheru. He's a Business Research and Development Manager at Uga Fold. It's a microfinance organization in Uganda. And Nixon, thank you. Special thanks for you because you jump in on a short notice um, for uh, your boss, Shafi Nambobi, who um, had to go to another appointment. Uh, thanks to all of you for being with us. And uh, let me set the stage by just informing you about the topics uh, we will discuss today. Uh, we have last time uh, discussed already about the impact of the war in Ukraine on neighboring countries, on refugees, refugee finance in neighboring countries. And um, today we again look at a couple of macro issues. We have prepared quite some analytics for you um, that appear and unfold as a result of the war in neighboring countries, such as remittances um, due to the economic decline. Uh, there are quite some remittances flows in the region that go um, from some countries to the other countries, and they are getting affected now. We have a, a point to discuss the impact of the war on financial service providers and their balance sheets, their portfolios. But of course, we also want to hear what are, could be solutions in, uh, to these issues, to these problems for financial service providers to get on with their business, to keep servicing clients, and in particular, keep servicing refugees, and also uh, touch upon potential fintech solutions for FSFPs. Now, with no further delay, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dumitru Vikol, who will set the stage by outlining some key issues are driven by the war, including the cost of capital and also about inflation. Uh, Dumitru, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for inviting myself. Uh, I'll try to, to, to touch on a few uh, points like rising cost of capital, um, 
the deglobalization more from the macro perspective, which I think that maybe the main driver of everything, anything that we see at the moment. So, I mean, we have been used to, to see a long-term sovereign bond yield very, very low for, for a while, but it has continued to rise in the past, maybe let's say 12 to 18 months. And that was a combination between, you know, unwinding of the asset purchase program from the central banks. Um, and of course, it, it we got a little bit more inflationary expectation that is, is, is feeding through everything. So you can see that everything is, is getting like more expensive and so on. So the chart is actually showing you how much how many bond yields um, had been negative in the past, uh, since 2014. So suddenly you can see that maybe in 2021, that the, the, the share, the, the, the amount of the bond with negative yield has ridiculously, has significantly reduced. And this is kind of giving you a signal that we are back to an environment where the cost of funding, uh, funding at least from the government's perspective, um, is getting more expensive. In the next slide, I will try to, to, to point out that even in addition to the rising cost of capital on the global from the global perspective, um, on the government, from the government side, I would say, of course, we also got some increasing country risk premium that was uh, driven by, by the recent develop, development in Russia and Ukraine. So you see the chart that is showing the CDS, the credit default swaps for most of the countries in the regions um, in Central Eastern Europe, I would say. Um, and you see like how the credit default swaps for, uh, for Serbia or for, for, for Romania has increased mostly because investors getting a little bit more worried about uh, those countries regarding the supply chain disruption and energy disruption, any potential implications um, of, the, of the military action and so on. So in addition to the rising cost of capital in the global market, we also got an increasing country risk premium. And all those two things is uh, giving you, um, giving you um, an environment where most of the investors will try to ask for higher yield for any type of invest uh, for any type of, of, of investment, and that is definitely is kind of going to affect the SMEs and so on. Um, in addition to um, rising uh, cost of uh, a country risk premium, it also got some dis disruption the commodity side. So in the next slide, you also uh, we are trying to make the point. Um, in the next slide with commodities, we're trying to make the point is that the prices of the agriculture products had increased significantly. You know that Russia, Ukraine uh, accounts for maybe 30% of the wheat, 20% of the corn, mineral fertilizer, and things like that. But another point that is very interesting is that we are moving probably into different trading blocks. And now I would say, you know, automotive companies like in the Czech Republic or Hungary, they can source the iron ore, they can source aluminium, for example, but from a different country, let's say from Brazil or Australia, but they are paying higher price in order to, um, you know, they're paying a, a premium in order to get this, uh, to make this, those um, raw materials available. So the point is like, even if we are moving back but uh, even if the war finished tomorrow, things like that, suddenly, even that we think maybe the, I mean, the, the expectations of the raw materials would go back, very, would go to, you know, to pre-war level, would be quite, you know, would be quite optimistic because we are in a new reality where the trading blocks is making you um, in an environment where you would have to pay a higher price for the most of raw materials in order to make it available, unless you are part of, you know, you can source those, um, you know, some particular raw materials in particular in the trading block around the Russian um, satellites or around the, you know, the US or Western, Western world satellite. So this frictions, I would say, is gonna stay with us for, for, for longer, I would say. So we have rising cost of capital from the global perspective, from the government side. We have, we have an increasing country risk premium for the countries in the, in the Central Eastern Europe. Um, and Central Asia as well. On the other hand, we have rising more raw materials. 
and that this is meaning that all of the companies that would like you know to develop to to invest or to to extend expand their operation they're going to be facing these uh these issues so in the next slide i will try to you know i'm trying to point out which countries maybe is the most vulnerable so of course you know that um that uh, so of course you know that some particular countries they have kind of significantly reliable on the Russian gas, you know, other one they like, let's say like Latvia, Czech Republic, or even 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 Moldova, Hungary, uh, other one they're importing a lot from, from Russia, so the countries like um, uh, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Kazakhstan, or the one that had net imports, um, high net imports from, from Ukraine, which is Republic of Moldova, and Georgia and, and other countries. So I would put in, in the region from the central from the central Europe, south southern part of Europe and up to the Central Asia. Probably I would say that Latvia, Czechia, Moldova, uh, Hungary, Bulgaria, and Serbia are probably the most uh, the most vulnerable to any commodity supply chain disruptions. And if this is happening, then then you got the government that is trying to deliver a lot of fiscal measures, the fiscal support. So they are trying, you know, to cap some 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 prices. They can, they're trying to reduce the VAT, or then they're trying to, you know, to increase uh, the wages and things like. That. But imagine the, the the biggest issue here is like you know, most of the government were expecting to have a, a solid recovery uh, in 2022, you know, to re replenish the fiscal uh, the fiscal uh, uh, reserve, you know, to go back to the fiscal consolidation. But now suddenly everything has changed, and those countries they have to spend a lot of money, you know, to support their household. So, even bigger issue is the fact that. If you believe that the European Eurozone or the, the world is moving to recession phase, let's say next year, for example, then the government would have even less room in, in order to, to support the household. So this is making the things even more difficult um, in the kind of upcoming year or two. And <clears throat> that important thing is like, in addition to this commodity supply uh, uh, disruption, we also have a a deglobalization. So in the next slide, you're going to see that a lot of um, multinational companies, they have already announced some deep investment. Um, and this is kind of affecting even the SMEs that were producing a particular component for a particular company that was exporting, for example, the Russian market. And these, this the, the divestment of you know, the multinational companies, it, it could somehow affect um, it could somehow affect uh, uh, the SMEs as well. On the other hand, you, you see, like you have this deglobalization out of, out of related to Russia. On the other hand, you have deglobalization uh, related to to China. The nearshoring that the more and more companies, maybe the German Austrian company, they want to uh, to transfer their facilities to you know in the in the Czech Republic or Hungary or, or uh, Macedonia, for example, but which is probably a good thing for some particular countries that they might benefit from this transfer. But we have to understand that, you know, that deglobalization means higher prices. So if this is true, then it's meaning that the um, interest rate or the government bond yield or the cost of funding should be high as well in order to, because they they embedding the inflation expectation um, uh, into 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 in yield. So it's just you know to summarize what we are trying to uh, what what would be the main message is that we are in an environment where the cost of funding is maybe will stay high for longer, and the inflation probably will gonna stay a little bit longer for us than expected. Probably definitely longer than we were expecting three four months ago. And this, in addition to the country risk premium, elevated country risk premium, and uh, and deglobalization is making you know the um, the uh, environment for SMEs a little bit more difficult. But of course, like you have, of course, the, the every every crisis coming with us some sort of opportunity. So this is would be the near showing. So any transfer of facilities that would need 
you know, to be transferred from, from the other part of the world in order to, to be closer to, to the main consumer demand, a consumer market like in, this, in the Western uh, part of Europe, then should be kind of supportive. So I think this will be the main uh, messages that I have from the macro perspective. So um, I think uh, if at the end we're going to have so many questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you very much, Dumitru. This was a very good stage setter and providing us with insights what is driving um, these factors that lead to more fragility and less stability, all the shortages you mentioned. And uh, I think we can say it's just unfolding. Um, it's um, still very dynamic. Uh, so um, it is hard to guess where things will move, but uh, it will definitely be a challenging time ahead with shortages on all ends. And that um, brings us to the next topic. We, uh, after um, your macro uh, overview, want to talk about remittances and the impact of the war on remittances. And this will be done by Dimitro Romanov. But before he's starting, um, we would like to shortly participate in a poll. What has been the greatest impact of the war in Ukraine on your financial institution? So uh, is it refugee demand for basic financial services? Is it reduced reduce remittances, is it sanction impacting their client solvency? 41% a refugee demand for basic financial services. Um, well, uh, we have to see here uh, what, what this means in detail, but I guess we will have time to discuss this. Reduce remittances, yes, and sanctions. So it's a bit of everything and probably there are also more. Thanks a lot for participating. And that shall be the stage setter for you, Dimitro. Uh, to enlighten us a bit about the current situation with remittances flows uh, in the region affected by the war. Dimitro, the floor is yours. Thank you for the kind introduction, Michael. Leading up the war, high oil prices and stronger economic activity pushed a relatively large inflow of migrant workers into the Russian Federation from countries with low average incomes. Uh, the majority of these workers are un- and low-skilled laborers. Uh, for example, nearly 70% uh, were involved in construction activities in 2019. Um, it's interesting that many Ukrainian nationals made this move permanently and tend to have been living uh, there for a longer period of time than workers from other countries. This is evidenced by uh, relatively low remittance level from the Russian Federation to Ukraine as compared to what we see with other countries as we will see on the next slide. So uh, despite overall numbers of migrant workers uh, to the Russian Federation, uh, the real impact of reduced remittances to source countries varies greatly by country. In general, most countries in Central Asia and the Caucasus are highly dependent on remittances from the Russian Federation. For example, Remittances inflows from Russia made up 83% of total remittances in the Kyrgyz Republic for the first three quarters 2021. And this figure was over 50% for Azerbaijan, Armenia, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. This is especially notable as remittances sent to these countries tend to be a lifeline to those receiving them. For instance, remittances uh, make up 31 and 27% of GDP in the Kyrgyz Republic and Tajikistan, respectively. These figures are comparable and in some instances larger than each country's export uh, goods and, and services, uh, nearly 100% in the Kyrgyz Republic and 155 in Tajikistan and 35 in Armenia. Uh, so I think it's uh, beneficial at this point to examine the issue of remittance from the perspective of another very similar historical event. Uh, in 2014, the Russian Federation uh, annexed Crimea and the Western regions from Ukraine. I should mention at this point that Russia's economy during that event was impacted by both uh, sanctions and low oil prices. So if we look uh, at the impact uh, of this uh, event on uh, remittances at both one year out and two years out, we can see that some countries uh, like Kyrgyz Republic, Uzbekistan, Ukraine, were able uh, to soften the impact uh, of uh, remittance decline, which was quite sizable in the first year. 
It is worth noting that uh, Uzbekistan also increased its GDP by 18%, meaning that remittances did not play an important role in their economy. Azerbaijan was affected not by a decline in remittances due to the insignificance uh, just below 3% of the GDP, but rather a drop of global oil prices. Since that time, the country's economy has been shrinking. And Tajikistan and Armenia showed uh, the worst performance because in the second year, uh, the remittances uh, dropped even more than in the first one. And it should be noted that uh, Georgia was not included uh, here as the share of Russian remittances to GDP was near 2%. Although remittances did uh, drop uh, by a quarter in uh, 2014, the overall GDP was more impacted by the country's strong uh, economic connections uh, with Russia at the time and the variation of the national currency. The projections, although the estimates uh, that the World Bank did uh, refer only to 2022 and uh, considering that the impact will have a slow effect, uh, a significant decline could be transferred to the next year as well. So this drop could be referred to as a crisis, uh, as a single event. Uh, there is expected to be a twofold impact uh, on remittances flows to Central Asia. A weakening uh, of economic activity in Russia will likely dampen employment opportunities for migrant workers, thereby also impacting their ability to send remittances. And weakening of the Russian ruble against the US dollar will likely reduce the nominal US dollar value of remittances sent in rubles. In the first two weeks of the war, the ruble depreciated by more than 25%, but after its regulation by the central bank, it bounced back and uh, currently selling foreign currency is very limited. So the real market price of the ruble has dropped, but it's not clear now, it's highly regulated. Although seemingly stable at the moment, this stability is uh, uncertain and may predict the ruble to decline against the dollar uh, in the next one or two years. Moreover, uh, the ruble and oil prices, unlike in the past, uh, seem to have decoupled, meaning that oil price increase are not likely to save the ruble's devaluation. In summary, remittance inflows to many Central Asian countries are likely to be affected adversely by the ongoing war. Overall, the projected decline uh, rate of remittances in this region is going to be around 25%. So overall, we find that remittance dependency as a percentage of GDP defines the impact of uh, reduced amounts. Some countries have shown a resilience in the past, showing better performance in the second year. A 40% decline in remittances from the Russia is not the worst case scenario. And pr projections um, are very difficult in the current context as they are dependent uh, on the scale uh, of the ongoing war, as well as the effectiveness of sanctions on outbound payments uh, from the Russian Federation. Um, now I would like to address a couple of questions to our special guest, uh, Mr. Michael Newsom, who represents the International Organization for Migration. Michael, are you with us? I am here, yes, thank you. Hi. Uh, so uh, what do you see governments in Central Asia uh, currently doing or considering doing to address uh, the double impact of reduced remittances and increased return in migrant workers? I think, thanks for the question, Mitro. Um, as I think you noted in your presentation as well, this isn't the first time the Central Asian region has, has seen this type of um, effect with the 2014 economic crisis, uh, where we saw sharp drops in remittances, as well as uh, large numbers of, of returns. You didn't get the return numbers, but there were significant returns within that period, particularly because the Russian Federation was really clamping down on irregular migration and irregular employment of Central Asian migrants in, in Russia at that time. 
the situation is is somewhat different. Uh, the governments we speak to in Central Asia are obviously conscious of the the likely negative impacts on their economies generally um, as a result of the Russian sanctions and, and slowdowns in the economy. And they're looking to implement sort of emergency economic relief packages in different forms that, that have been put forward by, by the various governments of, of Central Asia. However, they haven't looked yet at providing specific support programs for returnees or for remittance recipients um, seeing declines in remittances. And this is for, for a few reasons. Um, the initial surveys that we've done of migrants and, and households uh, indicate that uh, some have struggled in the initial months with about 20% having said that they've reduced the amount of remittances they sent uh, and 30% saying that they had stopped sending remittances. Uh, an additional 50% had said that the value of their remittances declined due to a decline in the value of the ruble. Um, this has obviously changed since we did this survey. This survey was from, I think, around early April, and obviously things have changed somewhat now. Um, but this is where IOM is looking to support governments in the region, uh, because there's a lack of data in terms of where migrants are, where they're returning to, um, which communities are particularly impacted by uh, remittances. So we're looking to generate sort of more detailed and up-to-date data uh, on locations of return, locations of communities uh, most dependent on remittances, so that in addition to these sort of general support, economic support packages put forward, uh, governments can also implement more, more focused uh, programs for, for migrant returnees and, and people dependent on remittances. Uh, and then more generally, something that governments in the region are doing is looking, and this is something they were trying to do even prior to uh, the crisis, is diversifying the countries of destination for, for their citizens. So lots of agreements have sprouted up with uh, countries in, in the Gulf, for example, uh, South Korea, Japan, more recently with the UK, really trying to reduce dependence on, uh, on migration to, to the Russian Federation. Interesting. And how have the war and the sanctions impacted labor migration to the Russian Federation in recent months? Um, in this case, I think the data is still quite limited and, and anecdotal, but we do have some information um, based on surveys of intentions as well. Um, what we've seen is that uh, the majority of migrant workers in the Russian Federation are opting to remain, even when they've lost their job or, or received reduced wages, uh, simply because they still consider their earning prospects in the Russian Federation to be better than their country of origin. What we've seen is that about 60% plan to stay, uh, only 35% of Central Asian migrants uh, that we surveyed plan to return, uh, with the majority of those actually planning to seek other employment in other countries once they returned. Um, so the administrative data seems to indicate similarly, we are not seeing a massive sudden flow of returnees. Uh, what we expect is that movements uh, from migrants leaving the Russian Federation will be sort of more slow and steady if economic and employment opportunities start to, start to dry up. Um, what we've seen, though, in surveys within Central Asia is that the flows that you would typically see going from Central Asia to Russian Federation have slowed down. So people who would go seasonally uh, or people who are entering the labor market for the first time and would usually move to the Russian Federation are opting to, to remain in Central Asia or to take advantage of regular recruitment programs um, because they want that security of having a contract and an agreement in place before going to the Russian Federation, whereas previously they would have gone and relied on their social networks to, uh, to find jobs. So those are some of the, the key things that we're seeing in, in the changes in patterns of, of migration from Central Asia uh, to the Russian Federation. Thank you, Michael. That's some really great insight into this evolving situation. Thank you, uh, thank you Dimitro, and thank you, Michael. Uh, I have one question to you uh, that is a little bit outside the frame of what you discussed, but it is also a connection to it. Uh, so we all know that uh, there has been migration in the other direction as well. So from Russia left uh, about couple of 10,000 uh, professionals, uh, maybe in the IT sector and others, uh, to those countries we are discussing, Armenia and Central Asia and so on, um, uh, to just keep working from there. Um, and the question I have is basically, I mean, are we seeing already uh, some impacts of that? Because uh, that means also 
uh, they are um, moving with their income to these countries. For example, uh, I had last week a talk uh, with someone living in Armenia, and he told me that in the last two months, uh, rent in Yerevan, the, the pay for rent uh, accommodation has doubled, and the, uh, the real estate uh, prices itself have gone up by 20%, and he was um, basically linking that with the inflow of migrants from Russia to um, Armenia. Um, so you might not be prepared for that question, but I just wonder um, if there's any link between the two uh, things we are discussing right now. Um, we can see them or we can maybe expect to be um, this impacting uh, the um, situation in, in those countries as well. Thanks. That's a, a great question. I guess uh, I guess I, I'll, I'll answer that. Um, but I, unfortunately, we don't have any you know concrete numbers beyond what, what you're mentioning as well. But yes, we hear anecdotal evidence that large numbers of, uh, of Russians have emigrated to um, Central Asia, particularly Kazakhstan, um, and to Armenia and Georgia. I think in Armenia and Georgia, it was most um, pronounced simply because they're smaller countries with smaller populations, so it had a greater impact particularly on the cities of Tbilisi and, uh, and Yerevan, uh, where indeed we've heard the similar stories of rents um, doubling of property prices increasing rapidly. And in some cases, people being you know, kicked out of their accommodation uh, to make way for higher paying rents from, from Russians. Um, so this is something we're keeping an eye on. Governments that we've spoken to tend to be of two minds about this. They obviously see the opportunities of having high skilled persons coming in um, with possibilities for investment. Um, and some countries have started to sort of put down the red carpet for this type of migration. Uzbekistan has been looking at particularly providing support for ICT specialists. Um, Nazarbayev University in, in Kazakhstan has put in place a program for academics to Russian academics to come. And a lot of them are also looking at um, their own well-educated migrants and diaspora in the Russian Federation who might want to return home um, and the, seeing this as an opportunity for that as well. So we're seeing yeah, some challenges, as you said, in terms of impacts on prices, impacts on, on resources, but also governments looking at what the opportunities are to try to get people to stay with the expectation though, that many will uh, move onward, say to, to, to European countries or elsewhere. And we already are seeing that sort of secondary movement, um, particularly from Central Asia to, to other countries. Yeah, thank you very much, Michael. Um, I think it shows that uh, uh, we have a lot of um, dynamics right now going on uh, that uh, make it a bit difficult to predict things, but uh, um, it's uh, second, third order effects we, uh, uh, we all will see and uh, countries have to deal with. So thanks for, for those very good insights and making the time to contribute today. And Dimitro, thanks for your presentation. Um, we uh, have time now to move on. I have another poll for our audience. Um, we would like to know from you um, to what extent the war in Ukraine impacted uh, or you expect the impact on your loan portfolio growth of your, of your institution, of your financial service provider. So uh, very straightforward, greatly impacted significantly, moderately, slightly or not impacted at all. And here we have the results. Uh, so that's exactly uh, what um, I had in mind, moderate, moderately impacted 43%. Uh, that's the largest fraction. Um, so um, it's, it's uh, something unfolding uh, that uh, probably will change over time. Um, but uh, we see uh, significantly impacted, greatly impacted already, um, some serious impact also visible. So just the right moment to have this meeting today and to discuss about the problems and the solutions and with that, we can go on to the next speaker. And um, I welcome uh, Malchas Zadzua, as I introduced him already, um, a practitioner with, uh, with deep experience, not only in his home country, Georgia, but uh, throughout the whole region and being a manager, a CEO of a microfinance institution and um, uh, in touch with, uh, with many industry actors, uh, Malchas. Um, what can you tell us about uh, your view on how FSPs in the region are affected and how they are coping with the challenges uh, they face? 
Um, thank you very much, Michael. It's a great to be back with you for the second session. Um, today, I want to touch on uh, three main topics from the perspectives of uh, the financial service providers. Uh, first of all, uh, this is about the increased risk for FSPs in uh, Eastern Europe and Central Asian countries. Uh, then we will see what we have learned from COVID-19 crisis management experience. Uh, and finally, we will discuss about loan portfolio growth issues as well as mitigated, uh, mitigation measures. So let's start with the risks that FSPs are currently facing in, in the region. Uh, we identified three main risk areas, uh, and they are uh, the high inflation, the credit risks, and cost of funds. So in terms of inflation, uh, we already see that annual global inflation rate has more than doubled as of March 2022, rising from 3.7 to 9.2 percent. Uh, in many developing countries, inflation is reflected even in double digits, uh, and we see this evidenced all around us. For example, food prices now are 9 or 10 percent higher compared to last year. Uh, and moreover, wheat and oil prices have increased by more than 50%. So although uh, inflation impacts almost everyone, we know that it, it, is, uh, it has a negative impact, especially on the living standards of lower income groups. And overly slow down in economic growth, rising unemployment and high inflation increase the risks of stagnation uh, for the nearest future. So in terms of credit risks, uh, loan portfolio quality is expected to, to deteriorate from 5 to 20 percent on average, also with the increased probability of default. Uh, this is especially true for clients with the high dependencies on Belarus, Russia and Ukraine markets. These factors, along with the reduced remittances on which uh, Dimitro has just uh, spoke, uh, can result in overall deterioration of solvency and um, general repayment capacity of the borrower. So it should be also noted that in such periods, we usually expect an increase in fraud attempts. So uh, the financial costs are also expected to increase significantly, and we already see this trend in, in the market, especially for locally for local currency funding. So moreover, uh, many lenders may restrict their new debt and equity funding due to uh, the high degree of uncertainty, uh, especially including regional and country risks. Uh, another issue is that uh, while funding sources may be still available in the financial market, the overall financial cost for FSPs will be higher anyway, uh, because existing liabilities uh, will be refinanced by more extensive new sources. So next slide, we can see how financial service providers can use their recently gained um, COVID-19 crisis management experience. So indeed, uh, there are some things uh, that we can take from this experience. In particular, uh, both crises were unexpected and resulted in complete uncertainty, especially in the beginning. Both of them have their specific cycles meaning that responses also need to take these cycles into account. So we have five or six waves during the COVID, and we also have now the five or six packages of sanction, which requires different responses from financial service providers. Both crises also resulted in significant restrictions on global logistics, shipping, free movement, and trade operations. Uh, and we also saw a growing importance of modern technologies, digitization, and offering more and more online services to customers. So, but at the same time, uh, it is important to keep in mind that uh, these two contexts are also very different from each other. First of all, uh, during COVID-19, we had the massive physical restrictions everywhere, uh, and most people have been forced to work from home which is not the case now in, in the Ukraine crisis. Uh, and also compared to COVID-19, the war in Ukraine and the refugee crisis has directly impacted only a relative few countries so far, so neighboring countries. Uh, it should be also noted that the post-COVID period became more or less predictable over time, while much uncertainty still remains about what the post-war period will look like after, after some time. So leaning into these similarities and keeping in mind the key uh, differences, we find that risk management systems in many FSPs 
which have been constantly evolving and improving during the pandemic, are better positioned now to adequately respond to these new challenges. Uh, and thanks to the COVID-19 experience, FSPs now produce better quality of risk analysis. They prepare more practical and productive stress test scenarios, and they have more experienced risk staff overall. So it is also important that uh, financial service providers now have a better understanding and the general consensus on the importance of risk-based decision inside of the organization and in all levels of their management and leadership uh, size. So the next uh, slide, uh, let's see what are uh, the loan portfolio growth issues and mitigated measures from the perspective of uh, financial service providers. The overall impact of the war in Ukraine has been a general slow, uh, has been a general slowdown in loan portfolio growth. This is mainly due to a general business slowdown, which has reduced the demand for credit products in general. At the same time, we also see uh, higher interest rates on uh, loan products, and this is mainly due to increased financial costs, which we mentioned already, and credit risks caused mainly by deterioration. Uh, in the solvency of lower income borrowers. Uh, this means that uh, companies will face more competition for a limited number of low risk and credit worthy clients in the very nearest future. Uh, it should be also mentioned that uh, there is still much uncertainty regarding the local currency fluctuations, which also limits further growth in loan portfolio. Uh, in response, there are some mitigated measures that can be put into place from financial service providers. So there are at least of some uh, short-term mechanisms, which may include the regular stress test analysis and risk assessment by the companies. And we know that uh, many FSPs who have very nice uh, systems, they already produce the weekly stress test uh, scenarios. Uh, also, intensive and direct communication with clients, especially those having export or import or business operations. Uh, uh, another uh, mitigated measure can be limited lending to clients with a high dependence of Belarus, Russia, and Ukraine markets. And we know that most of the banks already take these measures. Uh, it is very important to keep the effective communication with key internal and external stakeholders, including regular updates on the institutional and the local market developments. In many cases, we, we see that uh, the management of the um, uh, financial institutions, they pay more attention for external communications. They have the very regular and intensive communication with lenders, investors, government, but sometimes they forget about the internal co communication and the importance of having this dialogue also with the staff, branches and the internal uh, stakeholders, which is very, very important in these uh, crisis times. And we can see also some medium term mechanisms that may include the, the focusing on the new, uh, new unemployed persons as a potential self-employed microentrepreneurs. And we know that uh, for microfinance, especially uh, former unemployed persons are the potential self-employed persons, which is the one of the main segment for microfinance industry. Also increasing digitalization level to offer more competitive, flexible uh, and cost efficient financial services to customers. Uh, increasing diversific diversification, both with the target sectors and also to find some new industries to be financed, and also offering uh, special conditions to clients who can, with proper support, increase exports in other countries, because now there are some opportunities to, to replace some uh, business needs, which is uh, caused by the sanctions and logistical problems with the Russia, Ukraine and Belarus. So this was in brief from my side. Uh, now I to, to dive a bit deeper into a specific country context. Uh, I would like to invite Mr. David Russia from the Banking Association of Georgia to talk more about the Georgian financial service provider's perspective. David, the floor is yours. Thank you, Malhaz. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, the Russian-Ukrainian military confrontation uh, makes negative impact on the Georgia's trade relations. Uh, the results will depend on how long the conflict lasts, the impact of the war on involved countries, on regional leaders such as United States, European Union, or our neighbors such as Turkey, Iran, Kazakhstan, and so on. 
As you already know, Russia announced the leaving of World Trade Organization. And what will this impact of Russia's withdrawal from the WTO uh, and whether this move will lead to the formation of large regional units or trade zones will probably be the subject of debate in the nearest future. The sanctions imposed on Russia Federation will have their effect over the year. Both Russia and Ukraine are the largest trading partners of Georgia. In 2021, imports from Ukraine accounted for 4.5% 4, 4. Uh, of the total imports, which was uh, reduced uh, till 2.55% uh, for the April of 2022. The opposite is the case in, of Russia, where the share has risen from 10% till uh, 11 and 11.1%. Uh, 11 uh, uh, in terms of both import and import and export, uh, it should be noted that it would be very difficult for Georgia to even partially replace these markets as they are historically established export and import market leaders. And Georgia doesn't have a market of equal strength in the immediate neighborhood in terms of raw materials. For the export, there was a permanent growth uh, in the Ukrainian market. And in 2021, it reached uh, $307 million. Uh, dollars. As for April, it has been reduced and reached only $55 million. Due to the blockade of Ukrainian seaports, entrepreneurs have to use uh, Turkey, Romania, Poland road, which often increases the transportation time after two months. The Russian Federation also saw a decline in exports, which fell from 14% till 9%. 0.5%, facilitating the inclusion of large Russian banks on the sanctions list and making it difficult to make money transfer to Georgia and vice versa. When we talk about the sanctioned banks, it should be noted that most Georgian banks had correspondent relations with these large Russian banks. Uh, the Witte Bank of Georgia, one of the oldest Georgian banking institution has also affected by the sanctions and its fate is still unclear. In the first four months of 2022, Russia ranked the third position of uh, export market while Ukrainian Ukraine dropped from fifth position till ninth position. As for tourism, uh, <coughs> the period of delay of people entering the country has partially changed. Only uh, in the marriage from Russia, we received 45,000 visitors, while in April it increased till 49,000 people. How many of them decided to stay in Georgia before the end of the war? Unfortunately, our Georgia Statistics Agency uh, does not have such, such information. Uh, if we uh, throw a glance to the visitors' data from Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus, which are the core of the conflict region. We do not claim that this number of visitors will decrease. On the contrary, we may get an increase because due to the imposed sanctions, they may not be able to travel to Europe and America and will in, in, inevitably enter the markets of Turkey and Caucasus region. Uh, for the remittances uh, from the remittances from the Ukraine, they are declining naturally. It should be noted that the, the money supply from Russia Federation has increased sharply, and uh, for the end of the fourth month of 2022, it equaled almost 24 percent of the total inflows. If in the previous period remittances from Russia equaled 25, 26 million dollars per month. Uh, only in April, we received 132 million dollars uh, from uh, Russia Federation. 
Of course, we do not expect cessation of uh, cash inflows from these countries. In addition to the banking channels, the number of out-of-pocket currency has increased. The Georgian financial system is passing a, a rigorous test for the opening accounts for the foreign citizens and accepting transferred funds. The influx of somewhat counterfeit currency is also expected, but we are sure the Georgian banking system is ready to detect. Uh, I would like to say a, a few words about our banking sector also. Uh, it's difficult uh, today to uh, predict uh, what will be the result of this year, but uh, if we achieve a growth of 10% in assets, it will be a good indicator. When we are talking about 10%, uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, our Georgian market was increasing uh, during the last three years per 18% per year. So as for April, growth rate was only 3.6%. In April, the National Bank of Georgia did not take any steps to tighten monetary policy and the refinancing rate remained at 11%. As for loan portfolio, it has stopped its growth and uh, uh, as of April, it was increased only by 0.1%. The, nation, the National Bank of Georgia's efforts have gained some results and credit activity discontinued growth uh, since the end of the year. By this uh, uh, decreasing the credit activity, National Bank of Georgia tries to somehow um, uh, decrease the inflation rate, which is too high uh, while the announced inflation is only 3% and uh, real inflation is about 12.8%. Uh, the steps taken by uh, <coughs> uh, National Bank of Georgia to strengthen the larization uh, process show results in every kind of stabilization of Georgian LAR exchange rate. In April, the dollarization rate first fell uh, below 50% psychological barrier and stood at uh, 49 and 93%. It was for the loan portfolio. Uh, despite this fact, uh, in case of uh, uh, total, how to say, uh, deposit portfolio, which, uh, which are in uh, foreign currencies, uh, the rate increased. It was uh, very strange for us also. It, it increased from 60.22% till 60.54%. Also, the population was not in hurry to convert foreign currency into Georgian lives. Legal entities also stopped the rolling and free resources are converted into foreign currency. By the end of 2029, this situation uh, could be changed by the low, could not be changed by the low interest rates offered by banks in foreign currency. Increasing, decreasing the gel exchange rate is a driving element in the direction of increase or decrease of dollarization. We are expecting that uh, National Bank of Georgia will uh, make some new efforts to somehow uh, 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 decrease the credit portfolios. And uh, they are trying now to somehow battle with inflation. Uh, these remittances and uh, export and import uh, increases they are uh, how to they are balancing each other and uh, all will be <coughs> all results uh, will be shown uh, at the end of the autumn when uh, the uh, summer season will uh, finish and when the part of uh, the Russian and Ukrainian uh, people they return to their homes. Thank you. Thank you very much, both uh, gentlemen, uh, Malchas and David. Uh, that was uh, very insightful to see uh, what's happening in Georgia as a neighboring country um, and dealing with both with Russia and Ukraine. And good to see an active stance of your government and uh, your central bank um, and, of course, the Banking Association. 
uh, to uh, take the temperature and to deal with the matter. So good luck with, uh, with, the, with the next steps on that. And now I would like to make a huge jump over to Uganda because we have um, the uh, possibility and the opportunity uh, to listen to Violette Coubier uh, as a program manager for the technical assistance at Grameen Foundation. Uh, she will give us some insights what um, were her experiences in um, Uganda uh, in dealing with uh, refugee finance matters. So Violette, uh, we are curious to learn how we can uh, apply that insights um, in the current case here. The floor Thank you here. very much, uh, Michael, and good afternoon, everyone. So indeed, today I'm going to be presenting you a program we've developed with uh, SIDA, the Swedish uh, International Development Agency, the UNHCR, and three local FSPs in Uganda, uh, namely BRAC, UGAFOD, and Vision Fund Uganda. Uh, the main objective of this program is to provide access to financial and non-financial services to refugees and host communities, uh, 55,000 refugees and 51 host community members. And so to do so, we have developed a three-tiered uh, approach or a program uh, with a first component that is uh, debt funding from uh, the Grameen Credit Agricole Foundation uh, to the MFIs for them to develop their loan portfolio uh, by lending to refugees. Uh, the second component is a guarantee component with, um, that is provided by SIDA uh, to secure 50% of the loans provided by the foundation to these MFIs. And the third component will be technical assistance uh, with a subcomponent that is going directly to the MFIs for them to strengthen their operations and adapt also their services to, to serve refugees. And a second uh, subcomponent that is going directly to the refugees and the host communities. Um, through um, some grants um, to develop business and financial literacy trainings um, that are mainly delivered by uh, local NGOs. So when we uh, got started uh, in the program two years ago, uh, we found that FSPs were perceiving uh, the following key constraints in um, engaging with refugees and delivering financial services to them. First, they were perceiving reputational risks because I think they were perceiving some societal fears, some prejudices towards um, uh, refugees. And so this was reflect reflected as well in public policies and the media. Um, I think the FSPs were also seeing some potential legal and regulatory barriers to lend to, to refugees and deliver services to them. And last of all, um, there was globally, uh, I would say, a lack of refugee information and data uh, from the FSP side that was really fueling also this perception of the refugees being risky client, high risk clients. And so in reality, two years uh, into the program now, we see that the key um, operational constraints have been, first of all, KYC issues, because uh, most refugees in Uganda don't have a refugee ID card. Uh, so FSPs have had to find alternative ways to do KYC, and it's true that there are still important fraud risks, so it's very important for the FSPs to have very strong KYC processes. Um, also, we see a big constraint in the lack of tangible collateral from refugees, which clearly limits the maximum amount that FSPs can lend to refugees. And the last um, perceived risk from the FSP side also at the beginning of the program was uh, what we will call the flight risk. So the risk of some refugees going back to their home country. And so it's true that we've seen that to some extent in the north of Uganda uh, with some um, uh, refugees going back to South Sudan. Uh, but this has remained really a marginal portion of the clients. And most of these clients are also still repaying their loans. Uh, because they're going back and forth to South Sudan and Uganda. So overall, uh, we will say that this flight risk has not really materialized. And so two years into the, the program, uh, we are seeing the following results. Uh, the FSPs have opened four branches to serve uh, refugees, so near the, the settlements. We uh, have more than 8,000 uh, active refugee borrowers with a um, loan portfolio equivalent to about 450,000 euros. And we have more than 31,000 um, people benefiting from non-financial uh, non services, so mostly trainings. 
And it's also important to mention that uh, the repayment rate has been uh, very good. Uh, so pre-COVID, uh, it was excellent because it was 100% repayment rate. And post-COVID, it's still quite good, especially for the Uganda context, um, as we have a par 30 of about 4% um, in the branches of the program. So from our experience, uh, the lessons uh, so far we have learned two years into the program will be, first of all, that uh, refugees have business ideas and that they show a strong entrepreneurial spirit. So there is there here real opportunities for FSPs to provide financial services to them. Uh, we have also seen that many FSPs are uh, landing through the village savings uh, methodology, and this has proven really useful to boost savings, to enhance financial literacy. But what we also see on the field is that uh, refugees do have needs for other services, such as uh, individual loans, savings, transfer services, and so on. So here again, many opportunities for the FSPs to deliver such services. Uh, another lesson we, we draw is that there is not specifically a need to create uh, new financial services products for the refugees. Of course, in the Uganda context, it's very important to provide non-financial services, as uh, I've said, uh, and also, of course, to adapt current products. But uh, developing new products for the refugees is, in our opinion, not a prerequisite. Uh, also, we've seen from the field that having uh, strategic partnerships, uh, especially with local communities, is very important. And last of all, we've seen that employing refugees um, as a staff has been a key success factor for the FSPs involved in the program uh, because refugees speak the refugee uh, language. They are better able to understand the cultural differences and also the refugee intentions. So uh, employing, them, uh, employing them is really a key factor to determine uh, credit risk. So I guess I'll stop here on the presentation of the program, and um, I would like to invite uh, Nixon Kaheru, uh, who is the Business Research and Development Manager at uh, UGAFOD, and who will be able to speak a little bit more about uh, UGAFOD's experience in the program and uh, the perspectives. So Nixon, if you're here, uh, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. So, um... As a case study, uh, we appreciate we've been in, in partnership with uh, Grameen Credit Agricole, and they've guided us under the grant from CEDA. And in this, in the, at this point, I'll only talk about the perceptions we had before we say we entered into the refugee finance uh, space. Uh, the risks we envisioned, we were more or less the same. That like Violet just talked about something about uh, Refugee identification was a problem. Uh, the turnaround time to verif verify a refugee from the from the re regulator, the office of the prime minister. Again, they also they still didn't have collateral. That was the perception before we entered in. Uh, stable incomes, since they were not really grounded to Uganda, they really didn't have a, a stable incomes. But at the like the, where they would they would settle in and have sustainable businesses and then the potential of high default due to the flight risk so to manage these we we we, we had to review our hr policies to hire refugee staff to serve them so and you see refugees as much as they're living together they have uh, different facts uh, uh, facts in within them they have uh, factions within them so they can't speak to each other easily so it was of it was an advantage to hire people from different factions and so that they could understand each other. And then we also had to review the forms of identification to allow for attestation letters uh, to reduce on the turnaround time for verifications. We also acquired partners that would provide technical and business trainings to give them more sustainable approach to business to, to their businesses. And we are now, we are still, as we are, we continue, we are still executing partnerships. Every sort of partner that has an influence on the behavior of the refugees is a very critical player in the, in the, in the space. Oh, thank you. I have three minutes. Um, so we go, uh, the lessons we've learned, uh, they need financial literacy in order to be sustainable. Uh, they need uh, digital channels are really critical. We need to invest in digital channels, reduce the cost of access because we can't spread out through the brick and mortar uh, business model. 
the policies we need a, re a review of the policies our regulators need to re relax some of the restrictions and regular interactions with stakeholders is also very key that's why we said we keep uh, taking up partnerships with these with all these stakeholders everyone that has an influence on their behavior and we are now looking to expand for example we are within one refugee camp but it's very very big one office cannot sustain all of it so we need to expand with more uh, satellite offices around the refugee camp so those are the lessons we've learned and thank you so much for listening thank you very much nixon for your contribution um that's much appreciated so i think we can uh, we can move on i yes. give us a bit of perspective on uh on bgr uh, on romania Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael, and uh, thank you for having me here. I would like to introduce you to BCR Social Finance, which is part of the BCR. BCR stands for in Romanian for the Romanian Commercial Bank, which is one of the largest banks in Romania and Erste Group uh, uh, in, in Europe. And BCR Social Finance is a non-banking financial institution with a mission to create social impact through dedicated financial products and business education. As a group, we have uh, been active in setting up support system for Ukrainian refugees uh, in the first uh, two refugee st uh, stages. In, in particular, the group and especially the BCR, the bank, um, set up a comprehensive program that includes permanently adopted measures to provide refugees with financial and non-financial services. And this includes offering initial basic financial services, as well as providing essential humanitarian uh, support uh, uh, through direct donations and key partnerships uh, with uh, trusted NGOs. If we go to, to the next slide, I can tell you that um, um, specifically the bank was present at the border with mobile branches fully equipped so that the refugees can have immediate access to banking uh, services, opening special accounts uh, without, uh, with zero uh, cost for the bank and uh, with zero cost for cash withdrawals uh, throughout the country. And uh, it was, uh, it made also immediately available the currency exchange from Hivnas to the local uh, currency at the, the best rate, the rate offered by the National Bank of Romania. Um, it also facilitated donations to support Ukrainian children and youth directly, and also to the online banking application. Uh, participated in the development of the Jobs for Ukraine platform. Uh, if you're not uh, aware of what this is, it's, it's an app, an app uh, a platform that enrolls companies and uh, job seekers. And it's more than that. Uh, actually, the platform can be accessed from all over the world and with uh, employers, not only from Europe, but also um, you, you can name it. We have also offers from the United States. The platform ensures um, also relevant information regarding labor uh, regulation for refugees and housing information, and it is available in, in Ukrainian. Uh, another intervention was to develop uh, dedicated support systems for Ukrainian citizens, such as dedicated phone lines and email inboxes available in Ukrainian to ensure easy access and information for the refugees. And this is a very concentrated report on our intervention for now. We hope to do more for the future. Thank you. Laura, thank you very much for um, uh, drawing this up. I was really excited to hear about the NFS non-financial services with the uh, Jobs for Ukrainian program. Um, that sounds like uh, BGR is going beyond ordinary financial services to this very vulnerable group. That's great to hear. And uh, with that, we move on. Um, it's time for another poll. We're always interested to measure the temperature with our audience. Uh, what is your mood on the question, how has your institution considered implementing fintech solutions? And uh, uh, so you, you have five options to answer. If you would please answer them and we can have a look at this. Of course, the topic of fintech is not limited to refugees, but um, as it appears, um, it can be connected. 
Um, as again, the example we just saw here about the jobs program is also a digital tool that helps refugees um, to cope with a very important challenge. So we are much looking forward to see what is the mood here on fintech, which has been a topic now for quite a while. So I hope to see many in the top layers, but I won't influence you. So let me see, we can pull up the results here. Um, yes, we are interested in fintech solution is a leading answer. And then we are currently implementing and um, we are and are listening. Okay, so quite active, proactive and little said in the last two slots here. So quite active sentiment. Um, that's probably nothing to really comment on what was expected, more or less, good confirmation. And with that, uh, we come uh, almost to the end. We have a, bit, a little bit of short of time, but Dimitro promised me uh, to be concise and uh, shorten it a little bit. Uh, so Dimitro, you will speak um, about fintech solutions. And um, as someone who knows uh, not only the Ukrainian market, but the Ukrainian market as well, I think you are well po positioned to talk about this topic. So we're looking forward to hear your thoughts about how fintech can help improve access to finance. Dimitro. Thank you, Michael, and to everybody here. So uh, from lending point of view, it's quite reasonable to finance uh, any person who is willing uh, to gain or, or, uh, or already has a stable income uh, as a salaried person or an entrepreneur in order to improve uh, the likelihood of successful uh, integration. But most formal financial institutions, uh, refugee financing uh, has seen as just too risky. There are too many barriers, uh, such as Violet said, legal barriers, reputational risk, lack of information. So very few traditional banks offer credit or loan facilities to refugees, despite evidence that uh, refugees repay in financial assistance assistance as quickly and completely as uh, the average uh, global borrower. Alternative lending tools can help refugees uh, get over the hurdles around uh, KYC requirements and the lack of credit history or collateral. So what are the solutions that could fill the gap? Let's explore them in more detail. There is no doubt that neither traditional banks nor fintechs uh, could deal with financing refugees without lending arms and the support of governments or donors. We will mention here just some examples of refugee financing. Uh, as Violet mentioned, there was a vision fund that was able uh, to uh, pilot some products uh, specifically designed for refugees in Uganda. <laughs> and in Peru. In Peru, um, it was a project that allowed Venezuelan medical professionals like doctors, nurses, dentists, uh, obtain <coughs> financial support to afford validation for their qualifications uh, to enter the professional uh, labor market in the country. Um, refugees resettled in Canada must pay for their medical exams and their travel to Canada. Since most refugees, of course, cannot afford these expenses, Canada offers them a loan. As a result, refugee families start their new life in Canada with a debt, uh, which, is, uh, which uh, they must repay uh, with an interest. In Australia, uh, FSPs also provide business loans um, uh, to skilled uh, immigrants and uh, refugees uh, so that they can obtain licensing or training required to work in their field or to secure a position uh, which matches their level of education, skills and experience. And uh, my, my, my box in Malawi case, it was the first financial institution um, to provide a full range of uh, services uh, to refugees uh, in camp. Uh, the bank saw the business potential uh, of this untapped market and uh, actually they uh, tried and received a waiver from the central bank to use refugee forms to allow refugees to open bank, bank accounts uh, tackling KYC barrier. There are many other uh, examples that are not mentioned here how refugees could be financed. But let's also look uh, 
at an alternative approach, uh, for example, developed by Tala company, uh, for those who do not have a credit history or even an address. Although not specifically designed for refugees, uh, it could be certainly uh, be used as a good example. Uh, so uh, they collect thousands of data points from a single smartphone. As it turns out, uh, how someone uses their phone provides many insights into their capacity to repay a loan. Uh, for example, uh, the data shows a 4% increase in repayment among people who consistently communicate with a few close contacts and a 6% increase among those who are consistent with uh, where they spend most of their time. Uh, they also found that uh, individuals that communicate with 58 contacts or more and makes phone calls that last for more than four minutes, uh, uh, last more than four minutes, uh, they actually uh, uh, indicate uh, strong social networks, uh, meaning they are more likely to repay a loan. If uh, more than 40% uh, of a person's contacts are listed by both first and last name on their phone, uh, they are 16 times more likely to repay a loan than someone who does not do this. Tala software crunches together these and thousands of other variables to establish financial identity of a refugee. How it works? After someone downloads the Tala application, uh, and requests a loan, it asks for permission to view the key pieces of data on their smartphone. The data includes texts and calls, matching transactions, app usage, and personal identifiers. After assessing all this information, which takes uh, just a few minutes, uh, Tala decides whether a customer is credit worthy, and uh, if so, immediately sends uh, the money via a mobile wallet. This tool is used uh, in developing countries uh, by more than 6 million people and has high repayment rate uh, of over 90%. As we can see, uh, user phone data uh, could serve as a rich source of factors for donative credit scoring. But mobile phone is not the only rich source of data. Many other financial, social and business data points could serve uh, as alternative credit scoring. Uh, one of the companies which I mentioned here, that is a data aggregator, is Upspot, uh, which has access uh, to Ukrainian credit bureaus and state registers that could actually be used and implemented into alternative scoring system. So, in summary, <clears throat> refugees have a strong need for comprehensive financial services, including lending. Uh, the refugee subsequent uh, is an opportunity for FSPs. Private-public partnerships are an important part of many refugee and IDP programs. Fintechs are naturally better positioned uh, to provide refugee with financial services. And we should think about usage of alternative sources of data for credit scoring because they are quite feasible in refugee financing. Okay, that's all. Uh, thank you for your time and participation. Mitro, thank you very much. And I uh, think your example uh, was very uh, illustrative to demonstrate that uh, innovation in terms of fintech uh, is particularly, uh, can be particularly helpful um, for uh, marginal groups like refugees. Uh, they just don't bring uh, the other data uh, so there is even maybe uh, not much alternative than taking those data uh, compared to um, someone like a typical micro client who is uh, working in his location and there are a lot more data pain points to, to be collected. Uh, I found that a very interesting. Um, all of you are invited uh, to participate in another survey. Actually, two questions here at the end um, where we have um, a question on the... Um, uh, on the support of financial needs uh, for migrants. Uh, so what you think is most needed and also on your plans, uh, what you plan to do in your institution in this regard, which will give us at the end of the second webinar, uh, some ideas of uh, what else might be needed. And I think uh, information our dear sponsors, Triple Jump and Microfinance Center are very interested in. So looking forward to your answers in these two poll questions. And uh, while this is being answered, I can already uh, make an announcement. 
So um, I'm glad to uh, inform you all, many of you might know already, that we are nearing uh, the uh, 24th annual microfinance conference, MFC conference, which will be held in Istanbul in Turkey, uh, June 29th and 30th. Uh, so I think you will also get a link and you see it here on the slide already. Um, of course, it's a great opportunity always, I can say from my own experience, to join the MFC conference, not just to meet with many colleagues and interesting people, but also hear a lot of good new information um, about many topics. And as you can see, um, the topic is not too different from what we were discussing in the last two webinars. We speak about microfinance investing through uncertainty. So we hope to see many of you on that conference and uh, in, uh, in a bit more than one month from now. Good. And yeah, we see the results here. 53% technical assistance to adapting existing new methods uh, would be interesting. Okay. As a consultant, I'm happy to hear that. And I think MFC and Triple Jump are also happy to hear that. There's demand for such services for specialists and our panelists will be happy to hear that. Uh, so uh, grant subsidies for non-financial services. We'll pass that on to people who have the grants and subsidies. Guarantees, same here. Borrowing for on lending, also needed. So the whole package uh, basically is, uh, is needed to meet these new needs. And 29% are already um, having that uh, in their strategy to help refugees. Great, super. And uh, 35 are considering this possibility. Okay, that's two, three months after things unfolded are uh, still explainable. And um, another third is basically not considering the possibility. And that also gives us a good indication that um, it's not seen as something very hot everywhere, which is understandable. And um, it's my great pleasure to close this webinar, the second webinar on refugee finance in times of uncertainty. I think we discussed a very important topic. I'd like to thank very much again our panelists, the special guests, and you, dear audience, uh, that you were here and wishing to all of us to continue the important work on supporting refugees and not only um, these refugees, but any refugees that uh, might come. And hopefully we have many learnings from, uh, from the current situation to become better and better in supporting people in need. It was a great pleasure to see you all here. And I hope to see many of you in Istanbul and of June and say bye-bye for now. Take care and good luck with your good work. Bye-bye.